This is a USP 9. This is a USP 45 Expert. This is an HK USP Match, a very rarely seen gun. And this is a HK Mark 23. In some ways, it is the big papa to the USP Tactical. And this is an HK P2000, a gun that seceded the HK USP Compact due to its popularity. I am unapologetically a fan of the HK USP, but I do have a complicated pass with it, which we'll highlight a little bit later in the video. Today we're looking at the history of the USP, but told through a unique lens known as pop culture. We'll look at some different USP variations and explore some of the TV and film references that those guns have been in. So buckle up kids, the 1990s, they're back. jump into the USP and all the cool shit that it's done over the years. Special thanks to the sponsor of today's video. That would be FLP Firearms Legal Protection. Um, they supply me and Chris and many of you with um, self-defense insurance. That way, if you're ever in a legally justified shooting, they will cover all of your attorney fees and bail bonds and replacement funds for a CCW gun if it gets taken. There's all kinds of stuff, right? Um, there is a we don't know the term, we call it a body cleanup service, right? Because someone has to come in and haul that body out and clean up that space. Um, and that guy doesn't do that for free. So they pay that guy, make sure he's paid a fair wage. There's a code that you guys can plug in based on what plan uh, you want, but the code is 1911, um, just the number 1911. That'll save you guys like about 30, 35% off the uh, different subscriptions, whether you travel or if you primarily stay in your state, family, whatever it is, you'll guys find something. We've got a link down below in the video description. So be sure to check that out. Now, instead of diving right into the variations of the USP, because we're gonna basically frame the video, where we're gonna talk about different versions of the USP and then some of the cinema references that they've been in, right? So before we do that, let's just cover some basics on what the USP is. Many of you know, some of you don't. So let's talk to you for a minute. So the 1990s were a big transformational time for HK. The only handgun they had in production at that time was the P7, which is kind of crazy because that feels like such an old gun to me, but you go, that's the 90s, man. I was alive in the 90s and this shit was happening, right? So the world was moving on to lighter materials and there was just sort of a different set of criteria that the world was looking for. Um, namely, right, polymer was really coming into play in the gun world. So HK was simultaneously running two developmental programs. On the SOCOM side of the house, they were working on the Mark 23, okay? On the law enforcement side of the house, they were working on the USP. The two guns share a lot in common. There's of course some differences, but they do share a lot in common. So think Mark 23, SOCOM, USP, law enforcement. USP stands for Universal Self-Loading Pistol. So the law enforcement community was placing a big emphasis on the 40 cal round at that point. And that's what the USP was designed around. So versus a lot of guns that were designed on nine mil and then when they would scale up to the more powerful 40 cal round and they'd start cracking frames and everything, the USP was designed around 40. So the nine and 40, that, that was a piece of cake. They had to scale it up a little bit for the 45. But there was also a desire for a modular system and HK, has a ton of modularity with their big designs from the MP5 to the G3 to the USP and yada, yada, yada. That is sort of a hallmark of HK. You gotta also keep in mind, it was the first gun to come out with its own integrated light rail. Now that light rail is not particularly functional now in terms of X300s and things like that. But hey, for the 90s, this was a big freaking deal, everyone. So the nine and the 40 came out in 1993 and the 45 came out a little bit later. Now let's, specifically talk about the actual base USP. The 
standard USP is going to be the first gun that we discuss. Now, uh, we're going to be talking all about movies and all that kind of stuff. You guys should play a game, try to guess the first movie that the USP was in. It's notable, it's awesome. We'll reveal the answer in just a moment here. But the USP is notable for a few reasons. One, and I would say primarily in my mind, it is the um, first gun that American celebrity named James Williamson bought. Um, you will know James, he uh, started Modern Family. Uh, he's a Magnum PI enthusiast. He's a big sort of ringleader of the um, Bojangles community. I am a fiend for a good chicken biscuit. And Bojangles is my go-to. And he also once condemned me to hell. Um, so who's more likely to go to hell, me or Chris? <laughs> oh, wow. That's a tough one. Um, definitely you. Yeah. <laughs> the USP was actually the first pistol that I bought as well. Me and James uh, are eternally bonded because of this fact. Now, I unfortunately, I bought such a good first gun and then... I made a classic mistake. I was like, oh, the trigger's too tough and DASA, and I sold it and I got a Glock and I went down the Glock path. Um, that's why I've been con condemned to hell since then. Of course, I have come around and now I have several USPs that you will see in today's video. So what's the gun like to shoot? I will tell you guys this as a, my true love is 1911s and 2011s, but I will tell you the USP is one of my favorite guns to shoot because it's properly a shooter. So it's got, it, it, one, it's got a really nice recoil impulse. Um, there's things that you guys complain about with the USP. We'll talk about that a little bit later towards the end of the video. But in terms of a gun that just works, I would, real deal, the apocalypse pops off. This is in the short list of guns that I'm definitely grabbing, it may be the one that I grab, but often when I'm out just exploring the outdoors like this, especially solo, and I've just got a gun in my chest rig or something like that, more often than not, this is the gun that I'm taking. So the question is, what was the first movie with a USP in it? And this has to warm your heart a little bit to know that it would be in 1994 and the film would be clear and present danger. Yes. That's one for the good guys. That's one for the good guys. Unfortunately, the gun was used by a bad guy. It was used by one of the like cartel henchmen. And I don't really think it gets any you know, proper use or anything like that. It's just sort of briefly seen by a, uh, a cartel guy being held. But it's so cool and good on the armors because, hey, for the gun to come out, or for the movie to come out in 94, that means they would have been filming it guaranteed in 93. That's when the gun came out. So it's like, man, an armorer got their hands on the USP right when it came out. Super, super cool. But that's just the first use in a movie. It's not going to be the first movie we talk about. To, for the first movie, I mean, we're really just starting with like tier one shit here, guys. So for the first movie with the, the classic USP, not the tactical, not the compact, none of that, the classic USP, that would be Heat. And if you need me to explain the plot of Heat to you, you've got, you've got problems in life. So the first scene where the USP gets used, I can't find it, but again, on the uh, Internet Movie Firearms database, great website, it's a total rabbit hole. Um, they say that um, De Niro has it on his, uh, like his plate carrier, like his chest rig in the opening scene where they uh, knock over the, the uh, bank truck. It's not really used, so we'll just skip over that to the first scene where you actually do see it. Here it comes. USP, hold it. Ah, we we're about to have the money, the money shot. So again, it's not like prominently seen here, but again, keep in mind, th this is very early in the USP's life cycle. So like this is, he's Jason Bourne. He's got the USPs running through the lot. He's looking through, looking for Wayne Grow, but ultimately can't find him. The man has escaped. He's escaped. He will resurface later in the film. Okay, the second scene where the USP gets used, because like I said, the USP is only in the first half of the movie. It gets ditched for a for a SIG later on. But in this drive-in theater scene, it gets some pretty cool use. There it is. Through the windshield. Badass. And that's the USP in heat. Tom Sizemore, just for good measure, comes out with shotgun. 
it's a bad day to be the driver. So that is uh, the USP in heat. Heat is, of course, as good as it gets, but it is not actually the movie that made me want a USP. For that, we have to swap over to the USP 45. USP 45 came out in 1995. Um, it was a scaled up version compared to the nine and the 40 cal uh, options for the USP. It also made one other notable change versus those, or at least versus the nine. I've never had the, the 40, so don't quote me on the 40, but compared to the nine, it swapped over to metal magazines. Um, these are awesome mags. Why do I say that? Because they're the same mags as the Mark 23. So that was the beauty of getting this gun in, going, oh man, I'm gonna go source all these mags, you know, it's gonna be pretty pricey or whatever. And I got them in and I'm like, oh shit, these are just Mark 23 mags. Like how fantastic is that? What does that mean? That means you get 12 rounds of 45 ACP again. And James has said this, again, American celebrity, James Williamson, but you know, he said many times like, hey, the apocalypse pops off. You could do a lot worse than grabbing a USP 45. You got 12 plus one. A 45 ACP, that's some get some shit done right there is what that is. So this specifically is the expert model, right? The USP has families, right? So the standard USP, there's the expert, there's tactical, compact, and elite, and technically the match, which uh, uh, stick around for that. So the expert was focused more on the civilian competition market. It features just over a five inch barrel. It also has a different style um, top. So it has more of this rounded uh, slide top design. I love the lines of the standard USP. I also love the lines of this, so I'm a little bit torn. It's like trying to pick between your children. Um, but this also uses the O-ring technology that the Mark 23 uses. We'll see the little O-ring right up here, which is designed to give you match grade accuracy without having to have hand fit parts. This also comes with a match trigger kit. Now, on all of my USPs, we swap out to the LEM trigger conversion, which I sent this to that American, James Williamson, and he swapped this out for a match LEM hybrid. It's the best of everything. Basically, it's a really, really badass trigger. The expert model also comes with adjustable sights. Um, that way you can adjust elevation and windage given that this is meant for more of a um, competition and accuracy-based approach. What's it like to shoot? To shoot. It shoots like a thumpy 45 USP. It shoots exactly like a USP. Why? Because it is a USP. But again, they just run. There's two notable movies with a USP 45. And the first one is the one. Uh, it is the one that made me want a USP and it is the the... the Really, the gun that got me into guns is the USP. The movie, we got Michael Mann. He is back at it. It would be Collateral. And if you didn't think Collateral was being on this, on this list, you're absolutely crazy. So the movie came out in uh, 2004. And part of the reason it was notable is that that is largely before an era where actors got particularly decent training for action movies. Heat, obviously another notable exception in the 90s, but Michael Mann, you know, I think I think it's a Michael Mann pattern here because he's both Heat and Collateral, which is crazy, that, that double duo on your action movie director um, resume. But um, Tom Cruise was one of the exceptions. He, of course, uh, takes a tremendous amount of uh, obsessive detail in anything that he does movie-wise, and he really trained for the role. Is everything perfect? No, by modern standards, you know, you could critique his grip a little bit or, or whatever, yada, yada, yada. But it's like, hey, we're kind of splitting hairs because he does some real shit in the movie where you're like, yeah, you didn't fake that. Like, you actually had to train your way through that. So the plot is very simple. Tom Cruise plays Vincent. Um, he's a hitman, but he says he's in town on a real estate deal doing a closing that night suspect why you do the title companies aren't guys i'm in real estate title companies close at like five o'clock the county recorder they're closed at like five o'clock so what are you flying in for an 11 p.m real estate deal gathering signatures for suspect but he hires jamie fox um to drive him around he's a cab driver and uh he hires him to drive around the usp first gets seen in this moment he's gone to collect some signatures for the closing by the way and he just paid jamie fox to sit in the car and wait 
No, he's oh, not. Shit. I think he's dead. Good guess. Good guess. Money line coming here. Well, I shot him. Bullets in the fall killed him. Oh, good writing. Good writing on that. And now the USP's like out, right? Hold on. So it's like, this is cool. Put like you're seeing down. a guy switch on. Put your hands right? down. Like, okay. Okay. Speaking clearly, get your hands down. Like, I mean, like, this is yeah, well I'm done. Sure. He's got that USP 45. Pop. Not the expert yeah. model like Pop. I've got. The standard USP 45. So this is where the USP gets unveiled, right? But it's not the first moment where it puts in some work. Okay, for the first big reveal. So at this point, Vincent is uh, upstairs up? gathering like some signatures for a close. By the way, I'm super suspect of this real estate closing. Is that closed deals? I haven't shot anyone yet. I haven't dropped anyone under the roof of a cab. Definitely haven't done it twice in one night. But he's gathering more signatures for the real estate closing. And unfortunately, Jamie Foxx is getting held up in the cab. I'll and this is Don't for shoot, gun man. guys. This is probably one of the top scenes of yep. all time. From a like, an actor put in some work and did this uncut, and it's quick and it's violent. And I mean, this is a, this is badass shit here. Is that my briefcase? Is your briefcase? Yeah, it is. Why? You want it back? I want your what? What else you got for me? Huh? Mm. And you'll notice one of the guys got it. So that scene is as is really as good as scenes get. It's the first reveal where you're like, oh, this guy's like serious, serious. It's not actor BS where we're using all these jump cuts and all this stuff to make them look like they know what we're doing. What, what they do with me on camera, right? You know, they just, just cut it all together so I look like I know how to shoot, but I can't shoot that good. It's like, that is impressive. That is genuinely impressive. And yet still probably not my favorite scene in the movie. Okay, for, for the best scene, we have to go to the, the club scene. To me, the club scene is, again, in that like grail status of like action scenes of, of all time. So there's so much that happens right in this scene. Part of it, and the first thing, nailed the song choice. I mean, nailed the music for this. But largely what it is, is it's, I think the great action scenes, there's an anticipation and a buildup versus it, it all just happening. There's some like, we're getting there, we're getting there. And then it's like, it really starts going. The club scene goes for several minutes before anything actually happens. And at this point, basically, Vincent's going to the club to collect some more signatures. He's going to kill some people, right? Um, but the guy he's going to kill, some Asian business guy or something like that, he's surrounded by a bunch of armed guards. So now we got an actual gunfight situation where Vincent's got to go in and he's going to have to lay it down. Like he can't just go drop a guy from a window. This is in a public setting, ton of people, and he's going to have to send it. But now also the cops are coming for him. So now the cops are onto him. The cops are coming for him. So we got multiple threats happening here all at once. There's our, our guy we're trying to shoot surveilling like he's actually doing surveillance before he goes again as a guy who's never done shit right like this is this is a properly laid out action scene the intensity of it is so good right and keep in mind stay quiet no gun came out like he's doing shit as quietly as he can before it goes loud guns out. I mean, keep in mind, guys, we're like three, four minutes into this scene, not a shot fired yet. And I'm into it. Like, I'm thrilled and nothing's actually happened. With the laser. Don't insult me, please. Ratcheting up the tension now. Watch this prone shooting here, or supine, I guess. And when it pops off, it goes.
a good reload. And like that, it's over and he's out. So it's such a cool scene because it, it takes so long to build up to, but once it goes, it goes and it hits hard. Amazing scene. Up next for the USP 45, second movie, would be Executive Decision. Uh, some of you may remember it, and I bet most of you haven't seen it anytime recently, but I'm telling you, it actually holds up. It actually is really good. So Executive Decision came out in 1996. Um, you've got Kurt, I mean, hell of a cast. You've got uh, Kurt Russell, Steven Seagal, we'll give him a pass on that, um, prime Holly Berry. I mean, my God. Um, you got John Leguizamo, um, Oliver Pratt. I mean, it's just like, holy cow, I mean, this, is a, this is a hell of a cast we've got in here. So the, the premise is, is fairly simple. Steven Seagal, he leads a team of uh, special operations guys. We don't really know what organization they're part of. They're part of something super cool guy. Um, and basically some uh, terrorists have taken over a plane and Steven Seagal has to send in his team of uh, special operations guys to take over the plane. That's a simple premise. Um, and if they don't do it, the terrorists on the plane have some DZ-5 gas that they're going to release uh, over Washington, D.C., and they're just going to, like, annihilate the city. Kurt Russell gets suckered into going because he has some expertise on the gas, so they're like, hey, come with us, even though, like, you're a nerd and, like, you're not helpful here, or is he, as it turns out. But anyway, the um, it's a dominant movie for the MP5. I mean, like, it's a killer movie for the MP5. And one other gun we're gonna have in an upcoming episode. But the USP makes its uh, appearance towards the finale here. We'll go ahead and play the clip. It's, it's, it's not seen prominently, but it's seen a bit here. And, and it's interesting because they dressed up a, a USP to look like a Mark 23. So it's like clearly they're going for Mark 23 vibes here. It actually even has the Knight's suppressor on it. And I, I can't quite tell what the light is. I'm sure it's, you know, one of the early Insight designs. But it's like they're going for it. So it's like, was it a USP tactical? Like, like, what was it? Like, I'm not entirely sure what it was. And I mean, Holly Berry can do, do no wrong in executive decision. That, that is all of the rightness in the world. We're looking for the sleeper. Where's the sleeper at? That's him. And he looks like it. He just doesn't look like a nice guy. And now he dives over and we got a fight. And the USP is on the ground. So executive decision, um, it's a brief use, but again, in terms of the USP 45, like there's not a lot of uses for it. And again, it's a little unclear, like, hey, they're clearly going for Mark 23 vibes. Was it a tactical? What exactly was it? Not entirely sure, but it's like, it was a USP. It was not a Mark 23. Guys, executive decision is a great movie and it takes place on a plane. You know what's great to take on a plane? Candy. You know what big techs send you in your freaking orders? Candy. So if you order your gear from Big Tex, pretty much whatever you need, a litany of products, a smorgasbord of tactical gear, they're going to send you candy. You take that candy on a plane, you're the most popular person on the plane, or you just get a little sugar rush. Whatever. I'm not telling you to live your life. I'm just saying, hey, they provide a lot of good things. They send you a copy of the Constitution. Take that on the plane for a little bit of light reading, right? Get inspired. So um, there's a code you guys can plug in for all of your geared needs on Big Tex. That would be 1911 SYN S-Y-N, to be very clear about that. Um, your order ship incredibly fast. Anyone that's ever ordered from them, you can validate that. You'd just be like, dude, it's like same day your order goes out. And that is true if your order is placed before 2 p.m. Central Standard Time. So anyway, we appreciate their support. Also, if you're looking for any ways to support the 1911 Syndicate, um, hey, if you want help building out your gun room, that's like a little thing we're kind of adding into the wheelhouse here. If you like what you see and you're like, I would like to do something like that. If you, if you live in Utah, we can actually help you build them I and we actually like do the construction and everything for you if you live outside of utah you know we can help you with the um designing and all that kind of stuff because hey there there is a there's a flow to making this look good versus you know making it, it look particularly generic so anyway whether you need that other real estate help let us know patreon's also linked below if you guys want behind the scenes stuff and all kinds of early access to cool stuff thanks <laughs>
USP Compact. So the Compact came out in 1996. The USP Compact was basically the um, USP answer to a detective style gun. Um, this is a P2000. It is not actually a USP Compact. I feel a little ashamed. Uh, it brings me great shame to me and my family to not have a USP Compact to bring you today. But I did recently pick up this P2000. It's the closest thing I have. They are essentially the same footprint and in many ways they are the same gun. The P2000, however, borrowed pretty heavily from the USP Compact. It was meant to be that next evolution of the Compact. We'll save all the details of this and why I think you guys are probably missing the boat on this um, on a different video. But the Compact, in terms of because this is the same footprint as the USP Compact, while I find there to be a bit of overhyped factor to the like, oh, this gun doesn't fit my hand well or does fit my hand well, for me, I can shoot just about, I'm not saying I'm great with it, but you know, I can make just about anything work. But in terms of me, for me personally, this gun is like made to fit my hand like a glove. So first use of the USP Compact in a movie. That would be Mission Impossible 2. Great movie? No. Definitely the uh, weak link in the, uh, in the series there. Seemingly more about Tom Cruise's hair than it is about any mission, but the USP Compact does get used at the end of the film. So the whole motorcycle chase that happens, our man Ethan Hunt has a Beretta 92 throughout that but the USP sort of shows up here. So it's the finale, we're racing motorcycles at each other because that's a logical thing to do on the beach. Um, and then that happens. And somehow the motorcycles blew up. So you'll see the USP, there it is flying through the air and it's in the sand. Okay, so that's the USP compact. So we know at this point we have a compact that is buried in the sand and is about to get a little bit of a torture test as you will see. But first, some very interesting fighting tactics are, are gonna take place in a leather jacket. There's the USP, just got kicked, literally kicked the gun for no reason at all. Well, not for no reason, but. So some of the moves that Tom Cruise developed in the finale here, I'm not sure why this stuff is not happening inside of the UFC. I might have to place a call to Dana White and see if they can start implementing some of this. A oh, rear naked choke, no big deal. Just do that. Look at that hair though. The hair is so good. First of all, she's beautiful. She's been hit with some sort of virus. And you're gonna say that about her? And Ethan Hunt will not stand for this. You know what he's gonna do? He's gonna kick your stupid face off is what he's gonna do with the ocean crashing in the background. That move. I'm a little embarrassed to admit this is also John Woo, everyone. Uh, not his finest outing, but here's a USP compact. And it's down again. Okay. I mean, this thing is getting properly, like, torture tested. That's a thing. That's a thing, that kick. The cartwheel kick. Bet you didn't see that one coming. Okay, so Ethan has successfully eliminated the threat. Hopefully. Now he's got to go save his woman. Got Luther, he's coming over, he's gonna get the the serum. But uh oh, what happened? Turns out your kicks didn't work. Not the USP, 92. Now let's laugh about it. Give him a give Ethan a chance to maybe come up with a plan. Let's just giggle about the fact that we got a gun on him now. Oh, look at that USP buried in the sand. I'm gonna do this one day. Stupid asshole.
That's right. Look at that hair. The hair is still blown. It's nonstop wind out there. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about, everybody. He'll kick your face off. He'll shoot you with the USP Compact. Up next on the USP Compact list, we have probably a fan favorite. That would be Blood Diamond. So we've got Danny Archer played by Leonardo DiCaprio. And um, he flies into Africa with a shitty Glock 26 that no one cares about. And it gets impounded by some like, um, I don't know, warlords, I guess we'll call them. So he goes into a bar, he's talking to his bartender buddy, and he needs to find a new pistol. How the body, Miss Archer? Body find me. See the cash? So you want something nice? You want something nice. The best you can get a hold of, all right? So what he yeah, finds him is a USP compact, right? So now Danny has a USP compact, and that is with him through the entirety of the movie. Stop! So Danny and Solomon, they wind stop. up in a little bit of a scuffle He's here. Down there. He's trying to find his son. You are not going down there. Are we clear? <laughs> USB compact. Don't you move, huh? My son is there. Your not a great grip. Great actor, not a great grip, though. USB compact. Not exactly like a motivational scene here, but it is a scene for the USB compact. So Danny also uses the USP, um, we've got a, well, frankly, he lies. He used the U USP and he lies and shoots people with it. So he acts like he's a prisoner and Solomon's holding him. I feel like this plan could have been hashed out a little better in advance of this. Like they just kind of ran into it. USP Compact. Those guys are done. They are officially done. The USP Compact. So also in TV show, very notable TV show. Shoot, I mean, if we were really going to argue what's the best use of the USP Compact, it would probably be in the great TV show 24 starring Kiefer Sutherland. So in season three, it became the handgun of choice for Jack Bauer. Jack Bauer is, uh, he works for CTU, counterterrorism unit. I still don't really think we ever find out exactly what CTU is. I think it's just its own thing in the show. But the USB compact gets used through, um, or for seasons three through eight. So once he adopted it, he really stuck with it. And again, I'm pulling this from the Internet Movie Firearms database, but they said when when he picked the USP compact to be the gun, he literally, for those five seasons, only, or is that six seasons? But regardless, he only had two actual USP compacts because literally he's like a method actor and he's like, no, I don't want to just be holding a different gun like every <clears throat> episode or scene or whatever it is. So literally it was two guns. I mean, to me, that makes those two guns pretty like iconic and I mean they've got to be worth something I don't know if they've ever gone to private collections or anything at that point but the show 24 one it's a great show two of notable notable heavy use for the USP compact <laughs> So we save the best for last because that is the appropriate thing to do. The most fun, and I would say probably by a long shot, the least seen USP variant, that would be the USP match. And if you don't get some sort of just like gut visceral, like, fuck yeah, bro, when you see this, then I don't know what to tell you. You might be dead inside. And as someone who is dead inside, if this doesn't do something for you, you're dead, you're dead inside, okay? So... Um, these have not been produced since really, I believe late nineties, maybe they pushed into the early two thousands, but I mean, these are pushing about 25 years since these be made, since these be made. Well, that's just good fucking English today, everyone. You know what? It's hot. It's like a hundred degrees and that's what you're going to get. I'm not even going to bleep that out. I'm going to leave it in so you guys can have fun down in the comments. Um, the match was aimed at the U S competition market and it has a six inch barrel. So I'll break probably the misconception that that I had with this that probably some of you have as well. So if you look at the gun from the top down, we'll show you guys some other B-roll and stuff like that. But basically you got a cinch, six inch barrel. This is a match weight on the end of this, not a comp. This is not actually a comp, right? The barrel is just clearly visible right there. There's nothing to shoot gases up to drive the muzzle down. It's just a heavy front end of a gun and you definitely feel it when you pick it up. Okay, so this is also 
the first use of the O-ring um, in a USP. Basically, the way that works, the Mark 23, for the Mark 23 contract, they had to achieve match grade accuracy without having hand fit parts and components. So some German uh, wizards came up with the solution of a simple rubber O-ring that would basically made up right where the barrel locks up with the slide. And as the round travels through and it creates that little bit of swelling there, it basically creates a tight lockup between the barrel and the slide, giving you match grade accuracy via a little piece of rubber that's probably like two cents. You know, I mean, it's, it's just absolutely insane when you think about it. So this is the first use of the O-ring in the USP. Um, these also have adjustable sights and I would say maybe the coolest thing, just the damn two-tone finish. Like again, if that two-tone finish doesn't do something for you, I don't know what to tell you. In terms of what it's like to shoot, so some of you know what it's like to shoot a comped gun, where it's like there's that feeling of driving the muzzle down. This shoots different. It just shoots very soft. So I would also note it's just fast. It comes with that match trigger. DASA, again, because I want all of my USP set up the same, we swapped this over to LEM. So this is like a LEM match hybrid, and it's just a really fast trigger. So not that that was impressive shooting, but like it is a very notably fast gun given that it's from the freaking 90s. Well, you can't have a conversation about the USP match and not talk about the hot women that have used it because that is really what it largely comes down to and one black male um so it's it's you know it's like two two different camps here we'll talk about both um the first hot woman would be angelina jolie in tomb raider no surprises there y'all knew that was coming um it's a horrible movie but it is a massive showcase for the USP match. The actual movie guns, the set, because they're dual wielded in the entire movie, the set sold at Rock Island Auction for $35,000, just to give you a frame of reference. So here she's staring at the robot, looking very intense for training. The reloads just look so cool. The reloads are so cool on the match because you got that comp out on the end of it. Now, in the world of bad movie firearms handling, this is a notable one. This one stands out. I mean, she abused these guns in this movie. She beats the shit out of these things. It's amazing anyone paid 35 grand for these beaten up movie props. Okay, so at this point in the movie, I'm gonna be honest, I have no idea what's happening. Um, she's in some sort of cave. There's some sort of rock creatures that have come alive and uh, they're trying to you know, I don't know, hit her with rock swords or something. It doesn't matter. She's got two USPs. She's going to lay it down. It's great. The guns have no recoil. The gun doesn't have much recoil as it is in all fairness, but hers definitely don't have any. So now we have some sort of um, eight armed uh, creature. It's come alive. No match for the USP match. Pun intended. The reload system, if anyone has a design for that, like a CAD model, we should make that. This is a, this is a cool shot, in all fairness. That is a cool shot. If you're, if you're a USP guy, that's a, that's a cool shot right there, everyone. So you get the idea. Um, she's invincible. She can do anything she puts her mind to with the USP. The second movie that uses the USP um, match, probably lesser known, you guys probably didn't think about this one, but it is actually Blade 2 and 3. So this is our Wesley Snipes coming into the picture here. So Blade 1, um, Wesley Snipes had... A, a modified Mac 11, believe it or not. Um, I mean, since we're in the library, props all over the place. I just wanted to grab this. So in Blade 1, Wesley Snipes basically had a modified version of this that they set up with some sort of system that he uses to shoot vampires and all that kind of stuff. In Blade 2, he switches over to a modified USP match. So basically the two guns that Blade uses 
through one through two um, somehow are in our studio here. It's fantastic. You know, this is America and that should make you very, very happy. Um, so great movies? No, not at all. But are they notable for the USP? Yes, they are. The third movie, however, that uses the USP match would be Underworld. A movie more so known for the uh, use of the Beretta 92, but people often overlook the use of the match. So we've talked about Underworld before. Uh, horrible movie. Uh, you got lichens and uh, something, werewolves. It's like vampires and werewolves. They're hunting each other down. Age old feud going back God knows how long. Um, Celine, death dealer, basically a hitman for team uh, vampire. She uses 92s, they're full auto. They have like this barrel shroud on them, but she gets to use a match, which would clearly be an upgraded gun. So you'll see it come in. I mean, just a really clear, legible shot. I sure hope uh, you never get pissed off with me. Right, same. Hold on. Look at this bad boy. Check this out. Yeah. Badass. I think she shoots and I barely remember. I blocked this movie out to the extent possible. Yes. Badass. Good use of the HK USP match. She's got silver bullets or something. You've copied the lichen round. It seems they might have changed the finish on it ever so slightly. To me, it looks like a different color pattern with the uh, with the match weight. Regardless, very cool use of the match. So how do we wrap it up? The USP can be a divisive gun. So why do people hate on it? Well, they hate on it because it has a proprietary, non-modern light rail, okay? No red dot cut, uh, DASA trigger that can feel a little bit heavy for some people. Um, some of the mags, specifically on the uh, nine mil variant, just feel a little dated, right? Lower capacity, 15 round, right? In, in plastic versus the metal mags on the 45. Um, so really the complaint that people have is they want it to not be a gun from the 1990s, right? I love it because I accept it for what it is. I'm not trying to make the USP more than it needs to be. If I want something resembling a USP that has all the modern touches, I'll go get a P30. Yes, this has a component, it's not a standard P30, right? But if I want a better trigger and a standard USP, I'll swap it out to the LEM trigger, right? I don't care about running a light on a USP personally. I have other guns for that. I don't care about running a dot on it. I've got other guns for that, right? Your complaints around the USP center around you wanting it to be more modern, in which case just go get a P30. That's like getting an M1 Grand and being pissed that it doesn't come with an M-lock rail. That's not what it is. It's not a gun from that era. Let it be what it is. The USP is a 1990s icon. I accept it and I love it.